everybody, and welcome to the Save Sci-Fi Podcast. My name is Grin, your host, and our co-host is Michael. Michael, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you? Fantastic. It's good to hear your voice again. We only get to talk to each other once every couple months or couple weeks. So uh, <laughs> it's good to catch up with you, find out what's going on. You're on vacation there, right? So you're no school. You just Well, summer vacation, yes. Summer vacation. That must be nice. <laughs> yeah, I work. I work during summer vacation. Apparently now, so. Correct. Yeah, you're a karate or a taekwondo instructor, right? Yes, I have a current kind of like. Did we lose you? Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Maybe he hit the wrong button. All right, well, moving on, and our <laughs> our guest for today is uh, Sal Lagonia. Hello, Sal. Yeah, well, nice to be here. The pleasures of live radio going on right now as we speak, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Pleasures. Lots of pleasures. So th we're actually going to be talking about your, your creation, uh, Star Trek Cardinal, right? Yes. Excellent, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. As soon as Michael comes back, we can actually get this show on the road. Here I am. Yeah, what happened there. to you? I have no idea. Oops, you broke it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the gremlins. <sighs> no, I'm back. I, I think I might have accidentally um, hit the uh, Mute USB. Button. USB button. The something button. You hit the you hit the something and it and it messed up the <laughs> thingy. Yes. Welcome Get back. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So uh, we we just talked to Sal. So he told us, "Yes, I am the uh, creator of uh, Star Trek Cardinal." And uh, now, I'd like you, Sal, give us a, an idea of what is Star Trek Cardinal. Like, All right, well, I'm somebody who doesn't know anything about uh, what's going on in the sci-fi world, and I want to know what this Star Trek Cardinal thing is. I know Star Trek, but I don't know this. What, tell me about it. What is it? All right. Well, at its root, it's a grassroots movement to get a new uh, Star Trek series onto the air. Uh, <laughs> I've met with CBS with limited success. CBS does not want to start a new Star Trek series at the moment. For obvious reasons, I mean the the movie franchise is still going to such as to, as such as it is. Um, so we've been looking at alternative means of getting it on the air, and one way is uh, through the grassroots, through uh, fan support, and through um, you know groundswell movement. If we can get enough people on board to show them that there is still a market out there, and at last check, there's about twelve and a half million people who uh, in America alone who identify themselves as Star Trek fans. So. It is a pretty big groundswell if you can get it, uh, and if we can get them to uh, to see that, then we can get our show on the air. Uh, Cardinal itself is a new take on the Star Trek universe. Uh, we didn't want to simply bring Star Trek back, uh, seeing everything that we've already seen before. Uh, no offense to the original series and Next Gen, great stories, uh, obviously a, a magnificent show to have inspired all this, but it was 10 years of uh, the same basic uh, storylines. This, we wanted to take a look at a different angle of the Star Trek universe, try to uh, see some of the things that we've never seen before. So we centered around uh, the, uh, the border patrol of the, uh, on this uh, far on this far off border with this incredibly diverse uh, series of planets that it uh, that has that it's supposed to be monitoring. Uh, some you know they run the gamut from uh, uncivilized, uncontacted pre-warp civilizations all the way to you know full. Uh, sovereign na uh, nation states within the the, uh, the Star Trek universe, and um, it, it's it, it basically, uh, especially in the beginning at least, it's uh, more about the entire concept about uh, you know what is it to stand between uh, to basically to put yourself on a wall in between uh, heaven and hell, uh, the utopia of the Federation versus everything outside it, which is trying to corrupt it. And as time goes on, the storyline obviously gets much more involved. It gets much more in depth. Uh, the, uh, the the concept begins to expand. That whole "put yourself on a wall between heaven and hell" thing begins to become much larger, become much more of a uh, of a of a more abstract concept. Whereas uh, 
they are they basically become the ship that becomes the uh, the saving grace of the it has to be the saving grace it has to be the candle in the darkness for uh, everything that the Federation is supposed to be standing for uh, Federation of course as you, if anybody has watched uh, some of the later series starts to get a little bit less like the original ideals uh, rather than simply ignore this we're, we would rather address this to the elephant in the room and uh, basically move ourselves back as a universe towards this old concept. And we do so with um, a wonderful new ship, a wonderful new cast of characters, very diverse cast of characters, a very uh, a lot of things that we haven't seen before, a different type of environment than we may have seen before. The Border Patrol in many ways is uh, more military and in many ways is less military, in many ways it's more informal. Uh, it's a little less of the uh, the paramilitary, and, it, and at the same time, a little bit more of the paramilitary. So it's a it's a diff, definitely a different take on the universe. It's definitely a unique take on the universe, and that's what we really wanted more than anything. Some people have called it a, a deconstruction. I don't like that word in terms of what Cardinal is, but if you want to call it a partial deconstruction, you can call it that because we do like to address the the elephants in the room, the things that other people have called unaddressable. Uh, things that, uh, oh, Star Trek isn't about that. Uh, really? Star Trek's got to be about everything. It's about humanity and the human condition. We can't just leave parts of humanity out. So uh, we really, as far as I'm concerned, it's uh, it, it's a new take. It's a fresh take. It's something new that we haven't seen before. And uh, and yet it still retains the old ideals of the old show, the uh, the power of the individual, the power of humanity, and so on and so forth. No, that's great. In fact, this story sounds familiar. Hey, Michael, do you remember G.B. Hadjim talking about a, a, uh, a single episode that he was writing uh, and he he submitted and it had this kind of edginess to it? Do you, do you remember something like that, Michael? Yeah, it's not, I'm trying to place it right now. That was like six weeks ago. I have a horrible memory. Um <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, uh, I think that, you're right. that kind of idea, that that idea of the the utopian. I mean, yeah, okay, it's like a facade. You have this uh, uh, the way the Federation should look and and feel, but there's like these fringes uh, out there that you know the Federation, even though it's the Federation, it's touched by the outside areas where you might not have as much utopian as utopianation. <laughs> if that's a word, yes. But it's it's true. Eh? The further you get away from Earth in general, uh, the further away utopia becomes. And <sighs> there's always going to be those reaches, and there has to be those reaches because, simply put, not everybody is going to agree on what utopia is, and a lot of people are going to want to get away from their that ideal if they're if they have their own ideal, and uh, addressing the different. Worlds, you know that old uh, Candide sort of uh, attitude of the best of all possible worlds, is something that sh certainly should be addressed and is part of the the entire concept as a whole. Absolutely, and the way, <clears throat> sorry, the way this story plays out. Okay, you've got uh, a captain who is mm, done. I mean, he's like I'm um, submitting to medioc mediocrity. Dated. Um, more than anything, it, it's uh, if anybody's ever been in the military, I think you you know what I'm talking about. It, at at some point, you you lose the fire. At some point, you uh, you've dealt with people on their backs uh, that are giving you orders from miles away. They have no idea what the situation is, and it just you begin to lose the fire and you begin to forget what it is you even signed up for in the first place, and. That's a that's a uh, definitely a problem in any walk of life in modern day society. A lot of times, you know, we get into a job, we're excited as hell to to be you know here in our field and give it a few years, and you begin to see the warts that crop up. And certainly, uh, we've seen some serious problems in this in the Star Trek universe that uh, officers have to deal with. And uh, it get it got to a point with him where he is done. You're right. I mean, he's considering retirement. He is, uh, he's not an old man. He's a, he's a fairly young guy. He's in his mid thirties. He was once a rising star and, uh, he has become more of a paper pusher as the years got, have gone on. And he's got to learn real fast that he's the, the candle in the darkness right now. He can't do this anymore. 
uh, there's a situation brewing, and if he doesn't get his rear in gear, he's uh, the Federation isn't going to be there anymore. Because if you if everybody just submits to mediocrity, then it's it, nothing is going to you know this utopia can't exist. So he needs to be the beacon in the darkness. He needs to rally others to the cause. He needs to go out, be the old hero that he used to be. And over the course of the series, everybody that he saves, every every good thing that he does, every um, um, moralistic choice that he makes, it always winds up coming back to him in some way. And that's and that's what he really needs to do. He needs to build this coalition of new people. He needs to get other people out of the darkness and into and into, uh, into into passion again, into uh, being their own little candles. You have one you have one little candle in the darkness. Well, it can light a whole bunch of others, and that's basically what his job is. It's to be the cardinal of the Federation. It's to be the guy who goes out there and um, you know, finds a problem and fixes it and does so with, you know, the, with the fire and, and to, to inspire others and to inspire others as they go. And as I said, a lot of the time when he does these, he makes these good choices, they come back to him. And so there's this karmic uh, balance there. And if he's going to save the, the Federation, which is really what's going to happen, it's going to be him that, that does it. Then he's going to need this coalition with him. He's going to need all these uh, these people doing what doing right by by them uh, by others. And uh, he, that old the, the the morals that the Federation is supposed to stand for, not necessarily the ones that it is standing for, but the ones that it's supposed to stand for, and start to uh, revitalize the universe as much as possible. So this man's name is Michael Winters. Michael Winters. Uh, Winters, if you uh, know your Star Trek history, was the original, 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 original name. For uh, the captain and uh, Gene Roddenberry's first uh, pilot, before Kirk, before Pike, before April, there was uh, I can't remember his name now, Stephen Winters or something to that effect. Michael, of course, the Archangel is is obvious symbolism, um, and yes, his name is Michael Winters, um, and uh, he's, he comes from a long line of Starfleet officers, and he's a he's a unique take on the Star Trek universe too. Uh, we've seen each of these captains uh, in Star Trek history come from a different place. Kirk, of course, was the command rank man. He was the child prodigy. You, uh, uh, he bounced around to different departments so that he can learn uh, everything about everything there is to know about commanding a starship. He was the the uh, the golden boy. Uh, Picard was the scientist. Yeah, sure, he was a pilot for the most part throughout his career, but he, all of his decision making just screams scientist. Uh, whenever there's something going on, the the Borg are firing uh, and the Romulans are decloaking. And there's a what's the first thing he says? Conference. Brings everybody back to the conference room, sits there, listens to all the details, and uh, comes out with the best uh, solution from all the details. He's the consummate scientist. Cisco was the engineer. He was hands-on. He was always, you know, in the trenches. Well, Winters comes from a, from a unique standpoint too. He was a soldier. He was uh, part of a um, an area of the, the of Starfleet called the Naval Infantry, which is kind of like the National Guard. The the Federation doesn't really have a military per se. Uh, instead, it has uh, civilian organization, or I shouldn't say civilian, but uh, peaceful organizations which uh, can turn into militaries during wartime. And this is one of them. And uh, his father was a member of this organization. He was a member of this organization. And this is where he got his start. And uh, some things have happened. There's a, there's a long backstory uh, which uh, fleshes itself out over the five years of the series, um, which basically uh, he couldn't look at himself in the mirror anymore and had to find something else to do and went out to join the Border Patrol because that was the best option he had. The, he said at one point that it was because uh, it was the furthest away from Earth he could get, but in reality, it's, uh, there's other things. There's other parts to it. There's the, the sense of service and the, the helping of others and things like that that had drawn him out there. And, uh, as, and he has his own unique take on the universe, too, be, being a soldier. He's a little uh, less formal. Uh, because you know, a sergeant and his men, you know, are a brotherhood more than they are a hierarchy, and so he doesn't have that discrete distance that a lot of other captains have with their crew, which is a bad thing in a lot of ways. But it's also a good thing in that it fosters more of a sense of family. Um, he is uh, very hands-on. He's very uh, he he likes to uh, to to solve the problem at hand and not worry about what's going to happen five minutes from now, which is a very uh -huh. military way of looking at things. Uh, and basically, it, and all of these different traits build into somebody who's a unique um, addition to the pantheon of captains. And he he's sort of got this dichotomy with the uh, the ship that he runs, mm -hmm. where the, this USS Cardinal is also a kind of a relic of its age. 
you know, oh, yeah. more than something, just a ship that's got capabilities. It's got all these uh, wondrous things about it, but it's kind of been mothballed. Just exactly. kind of like his, I mean, yeah, this, this relationship between him and the <laughs> ship is pretty interesting. So tell me about the ship. What's the ship, the USS Cardinal? Well, that's intentional, the, the, uh, the dichotomy between the captain and the ship. Uh, because in many ways, I mean, the captain has all the tools to, he needs to be a great success. And yet, if he doesn't use them or if he doesn't use them properly, then, you know, what's the point? And Cardinal is the same way. Cardinal is a, was a marvel of engineering when it was first created. It was uh, a, uh, a, 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 a collaboration between different uh, design technologies. And more than anything, it included this amazing uh, sublight engine which gave it unprecedented maneuverability and speed at sublight speeds. And it's uh, basically, instead of having one or two big engines on the back of the ship, it's a web of over a hundred tiny little, uh, they call them micropulse thrusters, uh, that give this ship the ability to, to move in, in every direction uh, any, in, in such, in such uh, a manner that uh, it can outmaneuver any other ship in, in the area. The only problem is it could also tear itself apart really fast which is not exactly a not-too-apt metaphor for the crew, which could tear itself to pieces pretty quick, too, if it's not firing on all cylinders. Uh, and as a result, it was, um, it was rushed into service. It was part of an uh, ambitious project, and they wanted, and it was you know, cost overruns, and it was uh, taking too long, and so they rushed it out there. They put a celebrity crew on it to try to save face. Meanwhile, the, the engineer who created it was begging them, you know, don't, you know, put an experienced person on board, put an experienced person at the helm. They didn't listen. The ship killed its entire crew on its, on its shakedown crews. Caused a public relations disaster, been mothballed for years. And in many ways, very similar to the captain. The captain uh, was part of a, a not-so-popular military engagement and was out of it for a couple of years himself. And this, but this ship is, even though it's 20 years old, it's still top of the line because it was so far ahead of its time when it was first... Uh, launched and sitting around for 20 years while technology has kind of caught up with it enough that some of the gaps are filled and this is where um, a lot of the other crew come in uh, Tenor is the is the helmswoman she is the only one with the brain chaotic enough to actually understand how to uh, fly this damn ship uh, that these um, to keep the uh, all the uh, thrusters working in the same direction so that they don't tear the ship apart um, the uh, Engineer's mate is the son of the original engineer, who is the only one who actually can figure out how this damn engine works, who can actually get it to work properly so that it's not always falling apart or, or trying to explode. Uh, the captain, of course, is obvious. The chief uh, of operations, she's, uh, she's the one who rebuilt this ship with, with some of this modern technology. She tempers what was, the, what was this um, grand design with more practical um, solutions to some of these problems which would otherwise have gone overlooked and as such and she's the same thing she's also tempering the captain at some points she is his the angel on his shoulder uh, uh, that uh, becomes very obvious in the in the first episode she uh, she in fact appoints herself the angel on his shoulder uh, so each member of the crew the crew is the beating heart of the ship each member of the crew has a part to play on this ship and it's really the difference between the cardinal crew and the enterprise crew is the Enterprise crew had it all, and they knew it. Cardinal's crew doesn't know it. And until, it can, until they can put it all together, they can't be this amazing crew. But they have the talent there. It's all there, it's all there for them to, to come together and become this amazing crew, this amazing ship. Same thing with the ship, obviously. And it's simply not there right now. They need to grow, they need to come together, and they need to figure out how this works. And there's so much metaphor in there. It's ridiculous. I mean, I, 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 you can play with that so much. I can only imagine how the episodes would play out. <laughs> it's uh, pretty well layered. Uh, believe me, I have to... Uh, we have actually uh, planned out five seasons worth of episodes, and I've had to cut so many episodes down simply because I just don't have the time. Uh, there, are, there are so many stories to this crew. The characters themselves may as well be leading characters in themselves, each one of them. And the fact that it centers around the three most interesting characters, a lot of stories get on, get, uh, are not told from the Lower Decks characters, which uh, is, is unfortunate. But it, 
it's a, it's a testament to just how rich some of these characters are, some of the, the lower decks characters, that uh, you really want to see them on screen more often, and I just wish we had more time to do it. So this uh, guy who created the ship, Lettuce, is his name Lettuce? Yes. Lettuce. Like the food, and yes, that's a joke that, that's a joke that gets made. <laughs> <laughs> who made this ship? Lettuce. Uh, yeah, he's, well, he's a, he was a Romulan defector. Um, oh. He came over during the Dominion War. He was a Federation citizen, not a Romulan citizen, uh, which is a misconception some people have. The Romulans are no longer in this alliance. That's a it's part of the uh, the post Dominion War fallout. Uh, but he, a lot of the design elements on this ship are very Romulan in nature because of that. Um, the uh, a lot of it, when you think about it, the Romulans really perfected that whole bird of prey concept. Uh, so it's naturally that's where uh, you would go if you're going to make a small escort like this. And uh, you, you can see it. I mean, the the uh, there's a long naming tradition in the Border Patrol that they're all named after birds, um, different ship classes and different uh, ships' names. And so it, it was only fitting that she looked like a bird, this new ship. And uh, again, that's a very Romulan-type design. Uh, this new engine really was designed more for a Romulan brain to fly it, not necessarily a human brain or, a, or any of the other members of the Federation, which is a problem. And, uh, th and that's really another part of that whole metaphor thing. The races don't always get along together just yet. They were forced together because of a conflict. They did not gel together naturally. And um, there's, there's, that's not always true between the races. There's, there's a huge, uh, one of the biggest subplots in Cardinal in general is uh, this, uh, the fact that the Klingons and Federation are, obviously everybody knows what a Klingon is, the Klingons and Federation are moving towards a, um, a union more than anything else. I don't want to say one is joining the other, uh, but they are merging as, as societies, and that's not always a pleasant experience. Um, obviously, uh, they go about things differently. They have different ways of looking at things. They have different cultures. They have different uh, attitudes. They have different uh, moralities. And when you're trying to merge the two, well, each side has to give a little. And so that becomes an interesting subplot to this show as well. Right. So you you said you have I, I've 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 been looking at one picture, a really really dark picture of the uh, Star Trek <laughs> Cardinal. That was the only one I could load uh, today. We're actually still working on it. That's not a finished picture. But, yes, uh, I, I've been asking Sal for pictures of Cardinal for how many years? I know. Well, it's been a while. <laughs> we just finally started to work on them again uh, about a month ago or so, and we have this incredibly talented artist on board. And he's been working with my art director on, uh, on everything uh, about this ship, and the three of us have been, uh, in, have been working on this for the last month, and we have nailed down a new design for the ship because uh, we, we weren't really happy with the old design. Plus, the pictures that we had didn't even represent the old design, really. It was a very poor representation of it. Uh, it was some uh, amateur artists that were doing their part. Now we have more professionals on board. Uh, it, a lot of that is, has to do with me being uh, now owning a production company as opposed to before just being um, basically a writer who was trying to network people together. Uh, so now I have more a more assets at my disposal. I'm able to get better artwork and things like that. And yeah, there's only the one picture of the ship on the on the website now, just because that was the only one I loaded. It's not a finished product, but it's what we're what's where we are right now um, of, of where the ship is designed. And you can see it doesn't look uh, too much like any other Federation ship. But when you think about it, it actually does fit in with the design lineage of the escort type ship, uh, the Defiance type ship. Defiance, Norway, steam runners, those kind of things. Um, and it, it was actually designed to fit in properly with that design lineage. It wasn't just going to see something that came out of nowhere. And uh, you can actually see throughout the course of the series Ed, that the, the missing links between where we left off and Cardinal actually do fit in beautifully. Um, but, uh, it, so, but it, yeah, that one, that one blurry image that you might have, it's very dark because it, it uh, showcases the running lights and everything like that. It's more the way it's going to look in space. Uh, I'm going to have a few more up tonight, I think, uh, of the of where we are now. Again, they're very early shots. We're going to be uh, debuting the final product at Shore Leave 35 um, on August uh, 5th, I think? August 3rd. Uh, 3rd. Uh, and that'll be, that'll be the first time that the public gets to see the final product. It'll be up on the website after that. And, uh, yeah, like I said, we, we, it's been an exhaustive redesign, but uh, the... 
obviously the the uh, metaphor and the allegory that was associated with the ship still remains. It's just the aesthetics that we're working on right now. That's great. I, I, if you, <laughs> yeah, give me give me some sketches or something like that. Anything, <laughs> anything. Yeah, I'd really like to see the ship. I, I was kind of thinking like a, when you, when you were talking about the Romulan uh, influence in it, that it would have more of a bird of prey and less of a saucer uh, mm -hmm. appeal to it. Yeah, and this uh, you can if you when we get the uh, other thing that I said about uh, it's basically as soon as this podcast wraps up, I'll uh, start uploading new pictures to the to the Facebook page. And right, uh, you heard see... that everybody, you want to see new pictures of the the ship? Just go to the Facebook page after this uh, podcast is over, and they'll be posted up. So says mm -hmm. Mr. Lagonia. Yes, so promises Mr. Lagonia, uh, barring any nice power outages. Uh, but you'll see in the in the designs of the ship, the uh, you know, the weapons pod in the beginning is a bit beak like. The uh, engines along the side are very wing like. Uh, everything there is very practical, but at the same time somewhat theatrical, somewhat intimidating. Uh, you know, Batman dresses himself up like a bat to strike fear in the hearts of their enemies. An escort ship should look like a bird cutting through space. Uh, come to you know the, the albatross, come to sink your ship. Um, and and it really should be, and that's part of the uh, the design, the, the uh, naming aesthetics of the of the border patrol ships, the birds, um, you know, the the eagle and the phoenix and this and so on. Um, that uh, you know, they all have that part. They're, they're all swift and fast, and they cut through space and that kind of thing. Why the cardinal, Sal? Well, cardinal, uh, actually, that was focus grouped. Um, I had a lot of different ideas for names. And that one was the most popular. And originally I didn't go with it. And then I realized there was so much to that name that could be, that could be played with. And it, and it just it fit in so well with the, with the, the whole uh, concept. Uh, Winters is the cardinal, after all. He is the light in the darkness. He is the man who is to bring, uh, who is to organize this whole thing. Uh, the cardinal itself, uh, it has a lot of, the, the word cardinal has a lot of different meanings to it. Uh, the red shapes, the red color certainly helped. Uh, the the, uh, the ship is uh, tinted red because of its armor, and uh, its armor causes this red tint to the to the uh, to the ship. And so the, uh, the the idea of a cardinal streaking through the sky uh, was a was a great little aesthetic. And again, it was it was focus grouped in the beginning, and it was a, it was the most popular design. When I first came up with the idea for a show, um, I had written a Star Trek book years back. And it was, and it took place around the USS Yorktown, which I loved the name of, and I wanted to go with that as the as the name of my new ship. But it didn't have any larger meaning. It was just, it was just a cool name. It was, it was a name with a great, a great lineage and a great history with, uh, you know, the United States Navy, obviously. But it didn't have the same oomph to it that Cardinal did. Cardinal is a is a is a word that means so many different things. And the crew can mean all of those things. Uh, you know, it being again it, the the primary, the most obvious one being, you know, being the cardinal of the federation. And he and he gets called every so often the cardinal of the federation, the honorable compass sometimes also. And that's what he really is. He is the um, and so it it makes sense that the ship would reflect that also. And not only the ship, but the name of the series also, because the name of the obviously the name of the series isn't just the ship. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Enterprise was probably named after the ship, but it also had something to say about what the sh what the ship was going to be doing. It was going to be you know, exploring. It was going to be the great enterprise of humanity. Well, same thing here. This is the Cardinal of the Federation, and so Cardinal just basically fits in perfectly with the name of the the show. And I think that was a big point in the new series of, of Star Trek, where it was like uh, after generations. It seemed like uh, the shows were being named after the ship or the station or whatever that it was that this dramedy was being played out in, mm -hmm. and so not even a drama. Drama mm -hmm. was there a was there a dramedy? No, I guess not. Uh, I think you could call Cardinal a little bit of a dramedy sometimes. I it just happens to be I try to take Cardinal as seriously as possible, but at, at my heart, I'm a dramedy writer. Uh, it's it's what I've always done. Uh, I went back. I went to college at a time when that was a no-no. When uh, dramedy meant mash, where it meant you had to switch between melodrama and comedy, 
and I loved my own writing style, and I didn't like having to conform to, to the others. And then all of a sudden, Joss Whedon comes out and starts writing dramedies as primetime television, and suddenly it's okay to be a dramedy writer. So I have Joss Whedon to thank for my writing style actually being uh, a uh, acceptable to, to modern-day audiences. And MASH, but, yeah, you said it, of, MASH. Wow. Yeah, but, but MASH, think about what MASH was. MASH was comedy and then melodrama. It wasn't comedy yes. slash melodrama. Yes. Uh, it was it went back and forth, whereas uh, something like a Firefly um, is more. It, it's it's in the middle of everything. You're in the middle of a tense sequence, and all of a sudden there's a joke in the middle of it that just makes you bust out laughing, and that's the point. The the drama makes the comedy better. The comedy makes the drama better. It the the mood whiplash back and forth. If you can do it right, yeah. If you can do so it, right, I think that's it. And Cardinal actually, it, it sounds like such a serious show, <clears throat> and it is a serious show. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there is a lot of uh, morality, and there's a lot of uh, morality plays in this, and it it def definitely takes itself seriously. But it's a it's a very fun show. Also, there's a lot of jokes. There's a lot of humor. There's a lot of just the interaction between the crew. You can see uh, the the uh, potential for comedy in all of these characters. And I think a great example might be an episode I just I actually just finished writing. Uh, I won't give you too many examples. Uh, I don't give you too many uh, details on the episode, obviously, because oh, why not? Uh, <laughs> but the, the basis of the episode generally is Captain is in the middle of a court martial, and uh, for the first three acts of the show, it's like comedy. I mean, it, it, like every, everything that comes up, that the the funny flashbacks. Nobody is is uh, taking their. Yeah, you know, in Telus's flashback, everybody has a British accent, and uh, in Naomi's flashback, her chest is twice as large as it normally is, and things like that. And it's, it's like all of these funny things that pop up into uh, into these flashbacks. And then in the last act, all of a sudden, it comes back to the to the point at hand, and it gets very serious. And it's and because of the the good times that you've just been having, you kind of forget that this was a serious matter to begin with, and there was life and death at stake here, and. I think it hits you so much harder, uh, dr dramatic wise, because you've just been in, having such a good time with the rest of the show. And when you can do things like that, when you can um, take people from feelings of you know positive feelings like that to suddenly moral responsibility, or take somebody from a heavy dramatic uh, scene and then suddenly make it funny, uh, those kind of things are are what make for a good television experience, or what make for a great entertaining experience. So. Cardinal is definitely, if you're going to, I mean, I don't want to call it a dramedy. I think it's still a drama, but more so than the other series, it's certainly a dramedy, and especially when you consider that it's in the same vein as, say, a DS9, which was very serious, um, that it, it's basically DS9 with a hell of a lot of uh, fun attached to it, a lot more fun than DS9 was probably, um, that it, it does, it certainly has its own unique themes and its own unique uh, look to the, to the Star Trek universe. Deep Space Nine was one of my favorites, so <laughs> I agree. I'm glad you used that one <laughs> as a as an example. Well, DS Nine was unique, and that if you're going to look for a uh, for a way to bring Star Trek back to the to the big screen, that's or to the to the small screen, that's how you're going to have to do it. Uh, I look. I don't want to. I don't want to make. I don't want to be negative about Voyager, which you know, like I enjoyed Voyager, like everybody else did. But Voyager was you know, it really started off as TNG season eight. Uh, it wasn't unique. It uh, it had unique concepts, but they never went anywhere. It was basically the same thing that TNG was, just with new characters and seven new seasons. A, a specific uh, circumstance. Yeah, it, it gave you a different uh, setting, but outside of the setting, it's still Planet of the Week. And so, DS, but we you know, DS9 had a new take. This was a new look to this to the Star Trek franchise. These were different types of people that you wouldn't have normally seen. This is a frontier that you wouldn't normally be out on. These are the kind of people that the, the Enterprise would have stopped over for one week and then flown past and never had to deal with the larger consequences of what was going on. Uh, while obviously DS9 could not do that. They were a station in time and so uh, everything that had they had to deal with everything that came about. That was something new and that was something that uh, Star Trek had never had to deal with before. And same thing with Cardinal now. Uh, instead of pointing in a direction and exploring, well, we have the responsibility of defending this, this border, this border of incredibly diverse worlds and, and, and all of these different people that don't necessarily get along, and long-lost human colonies and pre-warp civilizations. We have first contacts to be made. We have uh, you know, mining rights to be negotiated. We have uh, smugglers to stop. We have all kinds of things that can happen in this corridor, and we can see the different aspects of humanity in this new environment. 
rather than simply seeing the best that humanity has to offer, we need to be able to see all of what humanity has to offer. You can't just uh, say, well, okay, the, the best thing that humanity can do is go out and explore and everything like that. Well, what about the people that are on the front lines? Those are the best of humanity also because they're the ones that stand on a wall. If, if you want to go for the back to the, the a few good men uh, analogy, they stand on a wall and let you sleep at night. And, you know, and, and I, maybe that's a bit of a military background for me, but it's, it's something that I've always been fascinated with and something that has always been uh, on my mind in, in terms of this. This is the important work that's being done out there. And there's so many interesting stories that can come about that. And there's so many interesting concepts and different uh, aspects of humanity that you can explore throughout that, that sort of, uh, that new setting and that new group of characters. And there's so much more that you can do with it that we haven't seen before. And again, it's, it's, this is all, the, the point of this was to take the familiar universe, the familiar concept of Star Trek, and give us something new and a new angle and a new lens and showcase things that we haven't been able to see before. Wow. <laughs> and I'm a little passionate, yes. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but you know what? It, it's It's been a long time since Star Trek has done anything you know, new. I think people, the fans especially, are really looking forward to something different, something new. And if you can actually bring that to the table, then I think the fans would be able to you know, back you up. But uh, what are you doing to get the fans involved? Well, we're doing conventions. Uh, we're doing uh, certainly uh, Facebook and networking and such like that on the Internet. The Internet has made it so much easier to get your ideas out there than ever before. Um, a member of my favorite band recently uh, said that he doesn't even know how he would get started today because the industry is so different. And meanwhile, I was looking at some people that had just gotten started in the music industry, and uh, they had gotten started simply by putting their work out there and people finding it. Uh, Cardinal has uh, really been taking that to heart of putting of putting it out there for all of its all of its uh, you know if, if there's any flaws please address them that sort of thing and having as much of a groundswell as possible and uh, we've had a lot of people writing letters to CBS uh, I've I've been in contact with CBS over other issues not necessarily Cardinal uh, for different shows obviously I'm a, I'm a writer on top I have I have other shows to to promote um, and I've, I've obviously been in contact with CBS for other things and it always comes back with me. It anyway. It always comes back to this. This is my, my labor of love, and you know they are hearing it. They they know that this exists, and they know it exists because people are letting them know. There's uh, there's been letters. There's been uh, campaigns. There's been internet campaigns. There's been conventions. Uh, you know, it's it's not like these people aren't at conventions. They don't, it's not like they're not putting their their fingers to the pulse of the nation. Uh, and so by going around and by uh, showing support and by showing that there is a definite audience out there for this, that this is something that warrants the, uh, the obvious uh, expense that would have to be put into it, and believe me, this is written on a severe budget. Uh, I actually, I'm a, I'm a, as an independent producer, the, uh, my, my, my work tends to be as budgeted as possible. Uh, I've actually been able to knock uh, Star Trek Cardinal down to about $800,000 an episode. But even then, uh, you need to you need to to tell them that their investment is going to work, and that you know all these people are going to show up. And I bet you I can get. I, I think everybody knows that we can get twelve and a half million Star Trek fans to show up uh, on the on day one, plus a lot of other people on the periphery if it's marketed properly. The question is, can you keep them? The question is, uh, will this expensive pilot episode that you have to put up uh, actually bring a return on the investment? And so we need to show them that there's a groundswell, and we need to show them that there is that there is still an audience here. Uh, CBS is not particularly fond right now of making a Star Trek show, um, but then again, the BBC wasn't very fond of making a Doctor Who series either. And look what that what happened there. Uh, obviously, it eventually got through, and it eventually and it became a hit. And this you know they they looked at it as a you know minor inconvenience that all right fine we'll give you your damn show, and what happened? It became a big hit. It became a big hit in both countries. Uh, and Cardinal could be this, and Cardinal could be the same way. Uh, you know, show them that it could be the, the America's version of Doctor Who. Obviously, on a on a much larger scale with a much larger audience. Uh, just being in America gives it a larger audience, obviously. And uh, so again, we've been, we I've been talking with them about other things, and I've been sort of sneaking Cardinal in there as much as possible, getting that in the. Uh, into the uh, into their minds as much as possible, and with any luck, if we get enough support and we get enough people behind it, then hopefully this can be brought to the big screen. So, for for funding, 
I mean, <clears throat> are you basically going 100% for the the uh, network kill, or are you doing any other crowdfunding or anything like that? Uh, no, we're going we're going straight for the network kill right now. Um, obviously, we need the rights and, and things like that, and and I'd like to see it done right. Uh, I, I don't mean to to, to put down uh, fan films or anything like. That. I love a lot of the fan fan film series, uh, but we want I want I ideally I would like to see Cardinal on the screen. I don't I don't I think this this has enough to it that it should it warrant its own series, and uh, yeah, that that's that's definitely the the goal. Um, I think, uh, you know, worst case scenario, we can always turn into a book series, but uh, I think that's still many years off. This has been a project that has been uh, in the works for a long time, and it's, uh, yeah, and, I, and again, I think just being, uh, the fact that I am a writer, and the fact that I, I work in the studio system a lot, uh, makes me want to uh, do this with the same type of uh, budget and the same type of uh, resources that a mainstream studio would have, not necessarily with uh, as a as a producer also what my production company can work with is obviously nothing compared to what the studio system can work with and so i think i, I it, it, when it's when it's a passion like this when it's a labor of love when it's your dream i think you really want to see it done right and so i really want to see it done as uh, uh, with the resources and the budget of a big of a uh, studio so when when do you think i mean what would it take to get the pilot episode you know started well, nothing's going to happen until the third movie comes out. Um, the uh, c there, There's no official uh, rule that says that CBS Paramount Television can't make a Star Trek series, but they basically have an unwritten agreement with Paramount Pictures not to make a Star Trek series while the movie franchise is still going. And it's and it's a three-picture deal for the movie franchise. Um, that being said, it's, it's going to take you know a good solid two years to get this thing running once it gets picked up, so time frame isn't necessarily a problem here. Um, but it's what it's really going to take is just CBS's go ahead and CBS's money, uh, for for lack of a better uh, uh, way to look at it. Uh, we looked at we uh, on a budget on a severe budget. We've actually knocked this thing down to basically just a little more expensive than a sitcom, and uh, you know in the, very much the same way that Battlestar Galactica tried to do it, where uh, they were able to do a primetime network quality show on a sci-fi channel budget. And we've been able to do that too, as to make ourselves more attractive to them, um, to make it appear as you know, to, to make us uh, to, so that they don't—they're not necessarily funding the next great, you know, two and a half million dollar an episode Star Trek series. Instead, it's a, a very basic—you uh, know—it's the same as any other show that they have, the same as uh, any other sitcom that they could have. And yet, we're going to bring in so much more, so many more uh, fans because this is—you know—it's it's, a—it's a niche market, and it's a. Uh, you know, we have all of these, uh, of course, the dramatic elements, which always bring in more than your standard sitcom. And so it, it becoming more and more attractive to, to CBS uh, that that's going to be such a great return on their investment. That's really what we need to do right now. We need to convince them that this is a good investment. And I think it's a good investment. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so do I. All right, we're all in agreement. Let's see if we can get CBS to agree. Well, I, I guess, you, you, you know, you bring up a good point about the movies they don't want to you know push any buttons there so we no. gotta let that movie but who's to say there's not going to be a fourth movie yeah and that's definitely that's definitely something we're looking at too and if if it gets to the point where there is a fourth movie now we're starting to push it into um you know a couple of years from now and frankly if that's the case again there's no written uh you know there's, there's no formal agreement it's, it's an unwritten um we'll stay out of your way kind of agreement between the two companies and I think if it gets to that point then we're gonna start pushing as you know hey I know you I know you have this little informal agreement but come on we've, we've got to get going on this it has been too long without a Star Trek series and you know you have this this crowd of, of fans and they're dying for a new series and this is it right here and you know th this is the one that's that's gonna get them all to the to the TV and this is the one that's not gonna cost you an arm and a leg I think they were burned when it comes to the, the expense. I know I'm, I'm focusing on the uh, the cost of the series an awful lot here, but that's only because I think they were burned with Enterprise. Uh, Enterprise, uh, if nobody, if people don't know, cost about two point six million dollars an episode. Where that money went, I have no idea. I, I look at the budget of the show and I think, my God, they they had this budget and they did everything they can to fill it as much as possible. 
they they invented new sets for five minutes of screen time that cost over a million dollars. It's it's uh, it was so wasteful, and I and I, I don't mean to put anybody down certainly, but I think that it got a little bloated and it got a little out of control. And uh, you know, something like Cardinal again, coming from an independent background, my production company is independent. My production company constantly makes uh, movies on five to six thousand dollars budgets. Uh, we have, you know, we work with with what we have, and we work with, uh, you know, we cut corners and we we make it, uh, you know, we, we work that kind of way. And given the resources of a studio and, and such, we've budgeted Cardinal out to about eight hundred thousand dollars an episode. And this is years after um, Enterprise was two point six. And so being, and again, I don't mean to belabor numbers. Obviously, this is not very entertaining to, to hear about, but it, it's, I think it, it goes to show. Uh, this is a be- this is going to be a much better return on investment than Enterprise was. Enterprise was never a very good return on investment for CBS. Uh, the the DVDs have not sold well. The uh, the show itself did not get particularly great ratings, and meanwhile, it cost a fortune to produce. But if you look at a show like Battlestar Galactica, which okay, it didn't have a huge market because mainly it was a sci-fi channel show, mm-hmm. but it had a, a reliable market of people that came back, and it was not particularly expensive. Yeah, it was and if you think budget, of uh, so, it was you know, a very low budget. They had a much greater margin that they could uh, survive on. Exactly. If they didn't have the viewership that, say, something like CBS would have on a TV show, <laughs> you know, they weren't out much. They yeah. Keep going. And if you can do that sort of show on that sort of budget with a primetime CBS audience. That's your new money maker right there, and uh, look, it's it's not. I don't think I'm I'm uh, bursting any uh, uh, any uh, bubbles when I say, yeah, the uh, it's all about money, obviously, and and for good reason. I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't produce anything out of my studio that didn't make me make at least money, a yeah. dollars. Uh, I have absolutely no problem with CBS looking at the bottom line on these things, uh, but that's the thing. We can show them this bottom line is has all sorts of potential. And uh, that's really that's really the thing that's gonna sh- that, that's gonna get the series made, I think, more than anything. And by right now, I think the biggest thing we can do is show support, show that we're gonna watch, show that there is a crowd out there that loves this stuff. You can't go to a Star Trek convention without people talking about what's gonna happen next. You can't go to a Star Trek convention without people talking about this is what I want to see on the new series. And believe me, in, in preparing for this, for, for writing the series, I went to a lot of conventions. And uh, for anybody out there who hasn't gone to a convention, don't take the media's word on it. Uh, I, I originally kind of believed that whole, uh, you know, 80s sitcom, guys in Spockier kind of thing about the, about the convention. These are great places. Uh, friendly people. Uh, this community is fantastic. And when you get them all together and talk about this sort of thing, you see the passion there. You see that there is that there is an audience out there just dying for a new series, and we really want to see this this new series be made. And a lot of people that we talk to really want to see the series get made. And uh, this is not just me saying, "Oh, well, it's my idea, and therefore right." Uh, I came up with a lot of ideas before this that weren't particularly well received. This is the one that's worked. This is the one that people like. This is the one that's been blood, sweat, and tears, and passion has been behind it, and uh, has gotten so much support. And the reason why is because this is the series that people want to see that the, that the Trek fan wants to see. Uh, I, I the, think that's about right because when I first heard of when like Michael's like he, he's all into science fiction and, and he bombards me with stuff all the time and uh, he told me about Star Trek Cardinal and uh, I was like oh another another Star Trek uh, series on TV okay you know uh, we've got tons of them we've got Enterprise <laughs> we've got Next Generation, we've got Deep Space Nine, we've got Voyager, you know, what's the big deal? And after hearing more about it, and, and obviously hearing your passion, and the way you've got all these intricacies of this story playing out, yeah, I think this is a winner. That's my personal opinion, though. Well, I happen to agree. Uh, <laughs> obviously, or, or I wouldn't be putting most of my fortune into trying to get this thing working and when i say fortunate i use the term loosely <laughs> uh yeah the, the the one of the things is we don't take donations at all here everybody always wants to know well what can we do what how where can we send money to, to help this thing the problem is i've seen so many scams uh about people oh yeah we're getting we're gonna crowdsource this new series and then nothing ever comes up 
I can't remember the name of it. There was one recently where it was, oh, it's, um, I can't remember the name of it. It was all about getting uh, an Enterprise season four and basically preying on people that didn't understand the industry. Let's get a million dollars together so that we can uh, get an Enterprise season four. Not particularly, uh, you know, most of the, most of the, uh, the, the people in, most people in, in, the, in the country don't know how much these shows cost. And so that sounds like it works. Oh, yeah, we'll get a million dollars together. We'll produce a bunch of episodes. <laughs> yeah, not the Enterprise was $2.6 million an episode. <laughs> uh, just rebuilding the sets alone would be $10 million. You know? And so basically these people, they took the money and they ran. And so because of that, because we don't like to be associated with that sort of thing, and we don't take any donations or anything like that. And uh, as a result, it's, uh, yeah, it, it ain't cheap is all I'm saying. Uh, to, to you know, be going across the country and going to all these different conventions, but it, if it if it gets me my show, if it gets me this show, then that's all that really matters. Uh, this has been a, again, it's a passion for me, and it's something that I want to do for the uh, for the Star Trek community too. The, the I, I said it before, I'll say it again. The community of Star Trek is a very it's just a it's a it's a great group of people, uh, people who are passionate about a show, but people who are generally just nicer people. I, I don't I don't. They, they are, uh, you know, th- this show has been influential in a lot of people's lives. It's been influential in my life. I know in a lot of situations, I was in command of, a, of an airfield ramp in life and death situations, and the first thing that I could think of, as stupid as this sounds, in every time something like that would have come up was, what would Kirk do in this situation? <laughs> and as, as stupid as that might sound, you have no idea how, how that gets you through. Well, and since we're, we're we're starting to run out of time here, so if if you don't mind, maybe we can get Michael to ask a couple questions, and then we can wrap it up. Right ahead. Is that good? <laughs> I'm good with that. Um, I mean, first of all, just let me say, Sal, again, it's great to finally get to talk to you. I've been talking to you on online since, you know, in some degree since I believe seventh grade. For which is you know five years now for me. I remember I was I was I was assigned a uh, writing project. And I had to find for some topic, whatever, and I ended up finding out about Cardinal and using that to write about. So thank you there, and uh, and thank you for all your work in promoting Cardinal too. <laughs> uh, you've been you're you're the one who runs the Facebook page for those out there that don't know. He runs the the Cardinal Facebook page, and that's yeah, been a big I help wish I had more time. To, it, it gets people interested. It gets people involved. This is something that I simply, I, I have too many projects going right now. I simply don't have time for it. It's great to have somebody who can drum up support for me like that. So, of course, you have all Save Sci-Fi to, uh, you know, help. Save Sci-Fi will, of course, support you completely, too. Um, I'm glad that you'll be going to the convention with me, and I can't wait for that. Um, is there anything else, I guess, other than the artwork, is there going to be anything new that you're going to be telling anybody there? Uh, well, it's going to, I don't think there's going to be anything particularly new. If, if, uh, if anybody wants this to be the, uh, the uh, announcement of, yes, we just got uh, you know, CBS on board, yeah, I don't think that's coming in the next month. <laughs> uh, although, although I did just sell a, a new movie, so maybe that'll help. Uh, but I, I don't think there's going to be too many new announcements. The, the new artwork, the new uh, ship, Basically, the new design is going to be uh, revealed at the convention for the first time, and then it's going to be up on the Facebook page and the website afterwards. The new website's nice. also going to premiere. Uh, the, the website's actually going to premiere the day before, so that people that go to the the convention can then um, find the website. Uh, the old website has been torn down. Uh, it's 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 simply out of date, is all it is. Uh, the, the show has evolved a little bit since. Um, the uh, promotions have evolved a little bit since. So we, we needed we needed to wash out some of the old and bring in some of the new. And uh, especially with all the new artwork and all the new uh, things like that. Uh, in the next couple of days, you're going to see some artwork up on the Facebook page for anybody who's a, who uh, is a member of that Facebook page. That These are all going to be preliminary shots. These are not finished models. They're just a good idea of where we're going, especially because the older shots of the ship are just, they're just so, I hate to say amateurish, but they were done by amateur artists. Uh, whereas... Uh, these are being done more by professionals. Again, just more resources today than we had before, and uh, yeah, and, and again, you're going to see the new design and the new and uh, that sort of thing rolled out. There's no other real uh, huge announcements that are be coming out of that. It's basically just going to be there to drum up support. But it's uh, you know it's always good to go out there and uh, and talk to any audience that will listen because every audience that will listen are more people that are going to join the cause. Of course. All right. Uh, we got time for maybe one more question, then we got to wrap it up. All right. 
I gotta think quickly of a good one. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> All right. I guess this is kind of a personal question uh, that I've been trying. I mean, well, I mean, in my case, a, just like a personal thought, not an overall, you know, general question. Um, I remember at some point mentioning an idea to you, Sal, about other, about maybe possibly exploring another galaxy at uh, some point. Is that is that in any way no comments. similar? Yes. That's the answer I was looking for. I was looking for that answer. Okay. <laughs> there, there's, there's more to it. No comments. Um, All right. I, I All right. can't discuss that with that part. Just, uh, just the other part. Okay. Well, I mean, I, mean I, I actually, just quickly, you know, says, you know, Sal sent me a while back the original script for the pilot, and I, he told me he's changed it. But I just want to say uh, to everybody out there that I thought the pilot was extremely well written already, and I can't wait to, because I'm going to believe that it will get picked up. I can't wait to see it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, no quick fire questions this time. We kind of ran out of time, but uh, a little too uh, long. Way. I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. It was great to hear about the show. You've got a lot of passion, and and we really enjoy that passion. So do our fans. So thank you very much. Uh, this is the Sci Save Sci-Fi Podcast, and our host, I am the host, Grin, and our co-host is Michael. Michael, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. You bet. Always. Always a pleasure. And our guest was Sal uh, Lagonia. Correct. I keep thinking I'm going to say that wrong. Sal Lagonia. As he everybody always calls me Longoria, thanks to uh, Evan Longoria down in, uh, <laughs> in Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sal, for coming on and talking about Star Trek Cardinal. I'm happy to be here. And uh, for those who want to learn more about Star Trek Cardinal, there you have a, a Facebook page. Uh, that's uh, facebook.com slash Star Trek Cardinal. And uh, they will have a website very soon, and that should be www.startrekcardinal.com. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, the old uh, Star Trek Cardinal.com, unfortunately, has been taken down. Uh, again, it just we got rid of the old and we're putting up a new for the for the new convention. It was just a little out of date. All right, so we're gonna get some new stuff on that website pretty soon, and it should be pretty exciting. So check that out in the next uh, week or two. And uh, thank you, every everybody, for joining us on the Save Sci-Fi Podcast. Have a great week. See you guys. See us out. Good night. Good night, See you, Michael. <laughs>